It is my pleasure to introduce this week's guest speaker, Dr. Helen Tardigrade from Southwest St. Wesleyan State College. She will be speaking on osmo regulation of bopyridine isopods. Testing, testing, is, is this working? Is this working? Oh, 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 how about that? The reality is, in most of the world that is now surrounding scientists, the bar has really been raised, and it is very important for presentations to achieve a certain elegance and sophistication that didn't used to exist. The importance of communication skills for the scientist, I think, are indicated by a recent survey done by Job Outlook when it listed the most important personal characteristics a new job hire should have, number one were communication skills. Number seven were technical skills. When they talked about desired skills, verbal skills came first. More important than computer skills. Okay, let's take a look at my first slide. Uh, that's not, no that's not, uh, perhaps we should, well, that's close enough. Actually, very close. Could I get, do we have a pointer? The best talks in science are those that present something totally new. The best thing in a scientific presentation is to practice your talk so that you're not standing up there halfway through your talk with, with the time ending. I, I think the quality of talks has not changed. I think there, People still make the same mistakes, still darken the entire rooms, still forget who the audience is, still talk with that monotone. Somebody puts up a slide that you can hardly see and, and then you can't hear them or understand them. And, and I, I just know that a shudder goes through the audience when that happens because you're stuck there for the period of the talk and people don't want to just get up and leave. The worst thing I've ever seen in a scientific talk. It was a talk where actually the very first overhead was so bad that I literally got up and left before the talk started. And he put his first overhead on and it was basically dark brown and you could just make out some black writing that was actually handwritten on it. The majority of, of, of speakers I've seen don't know how to use a laser pointer. The worst things are people who don't do any planning whatsoever, or apparently don't. Sure enough, puts the second one down there, and it's the same thing. It's dark, it's this dark model brown, really like it had been dipped in some brown shoe polish. People tend to use laser pointers to circle objects. So as rapidly as they can, they'll, they'll, they'll orbit around the thing that they want to, to highlight. And I got into this mindset of, if this is a bad lecture, and I'm here for 50 minutes, I'm going to get something out of this lecture, which is how, to, how I would do it better. You just know that if the person would think about it, there's one or two important points that they should focus on. In building one's reputation and doing well in science and doing well in the politics of science, the talks are all important. If you can't give a good talk, you can almost kiss your scientific career goodbye. I've been in a lot of meetings where people don't even know how much time their speech takes because they haven't read it once. <laughs> so what seems to be a 20 minute piece on paper becomes an hour and a half and everybody falls asleep. I think um, 
show you about In terms of rehearsal, it's very important to have read it through a few times, have a friend tell you what they think you're doing. PowerPoint can be a very effective tool, but it can also be overutilized. Now, filmmakers know that camera movement is a very exciting tool, but camera movement needs to be motivated. An unmotivated camera move is distracting to the audience, and it will pull them out of the story. The same thing is true with PowerPoint. Now, it's very exciting with PowerPoint to see charts and graphs and arrows fly around the screen, but you have to ask yourself, is it motivated? How is the PowerPoint movement helping you to convey the substance of what you need to say. So what else? What, you guys have comments? What should I do here? You can't over-practice a presentation, in my opinion, and, and make your colleagues listen to you, make your wife and kids listen to you, make everyone around you listen and give you feedback. And when you invite them to give you feedback, you have to graciously accept it. You know, you can't say, well, thanks for the feedback, but those are terrible suggestions. Uh, it's like, you know, teasing the turtle to stick its head out and then bashing it with a rock. Okay, we were going to get rid of this one. So let's look at how many slides I have. <laughs> I, re I rest my case. Yeah, I have, can you get that? <laughs> Well, I have, four, I have four, and you have how many? Three? <laughs> you have to decide in advance what you can cover legitimately in the amount of time that you have available. So let's say you've got 10 minutes available. You need to cover three primary issues, and then you can give the background on those issues. You can give some supporting data on those issues. You can explain why those issues are important. If you try to cover seven issues in 10 minutes, A, people won't remember it, so you'd better have very, very good handouts to give folks. And B, they will probably believe that what you've been doing didn't amount to very much because you won't be able to give seven issues the impact that they deserve. What questions are you hoping to get to talk? What do, you, what do you think people are likely to ask? Well, usually what happens is you, you try and run out of time so you don't get questions. <laughs> I, think, I, think the, I think the hardest part is for the audience to follow along so quickly, but um, I know at each slide you're supposed to say and now you look at this is a, a profile of depth over time I think people are going to be brain dead by the time they get to me anyway looking at the presentations in Dr. Moline's session what I saw was a lot of visual material which is great but it can also lead to visual overload now here in Hollywood directors learn very quickly that they can use color and lighting to emphasize certain portions of their written story for instance if everyone in the film is wearing red you can't tell them apart but if one character is wearing blue, then it gives special emphasis to that particular character. Now, in the movie The Sixth Sense, most of the movie is kind of a blue-gray color. But then, at certain times in the movie, they bring in the color red. And red is associated in that movie with death and with dead people. So when those things happen, the red color comes in and it gives those portions of the film extra emphasis. Now, you can do the same thing in your presentations. Let's suppose your entire presentation is mostly blue color. When you get to one portion of the session, you switch to red. That's going to give that portion of the presentation special emphasis. I think scientists uh, run the risk of uh, information overload more than anybody else. Now, you probably won't be able to read this next slide. One of the biggest problems with scientific presentations is too much clutter on a slide. There's a common cliche, never put more information on a slide than you could embroider on a t-shirt. If you need to show detail in a slide, follow a page from the cinema book. Go from wide to tell the story to the close-up to show the detail. Some of the most effective theories about communication talk about the arousal and fulfillment of your audience's desires. It, you want to pique their interest and then you want to satisfy that that interest that you've piqued. And if you fail in either regard, you haven't had an effective message. If, if you don't arouse them, they never get engaged and never connect and never listen. If you don't fulfill them, they walk away saying, well, you know, that wasn't a very satisfying talk. I'm going to go up and try it one more time on the computer. 
We, d we just need to go down to the convention center, so, yeah. A great many times in scientific presentations, the screen sizes are just too small. They're a roll-up screen that they have uh, run down from the ceiling for 16 millimeter projection. Somebody thought they were doing AV in the 50s. Or it's something they hauled in the room and jerked up and you put a, a slide on. The hall is very long. You're very far away from it. You're squinting and can't see uh, the source. In the design of a room, the screens should be large enough so that you can see a subtended angle from the furthest seat of a minimum today of 20 degrees and 30 degrees would be better. The first thing is to be relaxed because if you're tense, any information you have to impart, no matter how world shattering, is not going to come out with a, any kind of authority. In an acting situation, for example, you would do a progressive relaxation exercise where you would tense your arms and relax them, tense your shoulders, and relax them. Welcome to the, you want to get the mic fifth session in coast motion dynamics and pr prediction. The way the, the light will work, we have it set so you have 10 minutes on green and two on yellow. was fairly consistent as you moved offshore, decreasing, and ha had higher chlorophyll right along the shore. Um, a little bit onshore uh, upwelling or uh, uh, temperature break at the surface. Um, again, what's, what's very interesting here is semi-stable patterns in the community composition. Dinoflagellates were uh, primarily serratium and some dinophysis like uh, dinoflagellates. So in summary, uh, what's really exciting about this study is the semi-stable phytoplankton community structures in the LEO 15 grid space despite the differential physical forcing, uh, both the upwelling conditions and the stratified conditions. It went okay. Um, I was probably most happy with the timing. I was a little... I, you know, I, before I said I, it was, everything was okay, but I was glad a lot of the talks went a little over. I, I, I said um too much. No, it went okay. I mean, I, I could have improved it. I'd probably give myself C plus. <laughs> yeah. with the POC and CN uh, ratio numbers that Jay just uh, showed us. Okay, let's talk about this performance. Not bad, not bad, even with all those ums in there. He did a couple of things very well. He's got a good sound level, he's got his script worked out, and he's got good visual presentation. But let's talk about those ums. The first thing that can help him improve, getting rid of them. I think ums come from the fact that we're afraid of silence. We're afraid to let our audience know that we need a moment to think. Another thing that maybe is a little bit more subtle, he has a way of wandering. He walks back and forth and paces a little bit. And I think a stillness in his body, as even if he looked at the screen and then looked back at the audience, would help us focus more on the message. And I'd like to say one other thing. Don't give yourself presentation away to your visuals. 
Eye contact is a terrible problem in a lot of these presentations. What happens is that the audience stops looking at you if you're not ever looking at them. Part of being aware of space is being observing of your audience and you can't observe them unless you look at them and also looking at them it, it creates a feedback loop for you. You can tell what people are hearing and understanding and you are also making them aware that their understanding matters to you. And this was consistent with the POC and CN uh, ratio numbers that Jay just uh, showed us. Okay, let's talk about this performance. Not bad, not bad. Okay, let's talk about this critique. Not bad, not bad. She obviously picked up on the ums in my talk, and I need to work on that, and she gave some good pointers on how to deal with that. Another comment I really liked of hers, she was right on about moving around on, on the stage. I think that distracted the audience, and I really need to work on that too. Let me offer a critique about the room. You know, people come to these science talks, they really don't know what the room's going to look like. They get what they're given. And in looking at this video, it was obvious that the room that I was giving my presentation in was too narrow, uh, it was too dark, and the screen size was too small. Lastly, I wanted to touch on a comment made earlier in the video about the bar for scientific talks being raised. I think that's really true. PowerPoints help me give a better presentation. I know a number of other colleagues who have really given up on overheads and do presentations solely with computers. A presentation, uh, even by a scientist, should have artistic integrity. Okay? It should have the integrity of a fine piece of music or a fine painting or a fine film so that uh, the message is communicated so strongly that it stands forth and will be remembered and can be used forever. And here's a graph of ion flow, and here's a graph of membrane flux, and here's a graph of the time course, and here's a graph of the golf course, and here's a graph of my mom, and here's a graph of my dog Pete. Do you see how tight the correlation is? I mean, look at that straight line. It's almost perfect. I mean, I mean, the status. Yeah! Angel. Angel. <laughs> It was a dark and stormy night, and I was all alone in the laboratory. Our research has really done some incredible things as far as looking at the whole spectrum, the whole spectrum of what it is, however, more ever, whatever. And now I'd like to offer my conclusion. Bow pirate isopods need more research. Well, that's enough for today. Are there any questions? Oops, looks like I'm out of time.